Welcome. This is David Bowles, Human Meme. Today's topic, Flay the Wicked, Save the Monster. We live in a world of choices. An old high school teacher of mine was fond of saying, all the time, whenever we didn't want to do something, he told us to do, there are only two things you have to do in life. Make decisions and pay taxes. Oh, no, we don't, one student would always pipe up. And the teacher would then say, Cheshire Cat's smile wide on his fat face. Exactly right. You just proved my point. Then he'd make us do whatever it was anyway. It was always something dumb. It was horrible. But his point was well taken. The larger idea here is we all make choices every day. Some choices are proactive, some of them reactive. But all choices get recorded somewhere and used for us or against us. There are few choices that are suspended, neutral in space for all of eternity. All choices come back to us and come down on one side or the other. How do we go about making tough choices? Who lives and who dies? This conundrum of the living used to be called a Hobson's choice, a wicked choice between two things that is really no choice at all. The Hobson's choice phrase dates back to 1631 and English liveryman Thomas Hobson, who would always let a customer pick any horse he had as long as that horse was the one closest to the door. The more modern, awful, monster update to a Hobson's choice is more commonly referred to as a Sophie's choice from a modern William Styron book by the same name. Upon entering Auschwitz, a camp doctor forces Sophie to choose which of her two children will live with her in a labor camp and which child will immediately be gassed to death. Sophie chooses to save one child over the other not to kill one to save the other. And that choice destroyed the rest of her life. I call this process between the Hobson wicked choice and the Sophie monster choice, flaying the wicked, saving the monster. Because there are some choices, some decisions in life that have no end at all. One choice leads to another awful choice and around and around again. Everything will die in defeat. We all will end. There is no bargaining against time because we cannot outlast the circle. So to deal with this inevitability of living, we set up these false choices to give us hope in the depths of despair. There's an old neurological chestnut that argues our brains are so powerful, and yet we only use a tiny bit of their capacity because we are genetically programmed to self-preserve and protect. And having all that information available to us would be overwhelming in factual despair of everyday living, and we would be rendered immobile, not ingenious, against the force of the universe. And so, since our brains are proactively programmed not to know, 
to not allow us to view and perceive to our mind's capacity. The body and our psyche cannot dare to understand the reality of the danger and the feudalism surrounding us. We are actively choosing every day of our lives to stay uninformed in order that we may survive into the next day, luckily and without pre-planning or predestiny. Here are some of our modern wicked versus monster choices that are circular choices, a choice that leads to a never-ending another, another, another. Inoperable brain cancer versus chemotherapy. A Zika fetus versus abortion. Hillary versus Trump. Alison Krauss versus a fiddle. You get the idea. Yes, I'm being a little facetious. But about which topics? That's the brunt of this whole wicked monster circularity. The real dangers are hidden, while the pretend dangers take all our time and attention and oxygen and circulation. How did we come to such a space in the world where these phantom choices pretend to give us space in mind when thumbing the direction of our lives? There's a brand new stroke study out that contemplates how neurons build upon and with each other in the brain in order to create new comprehension and to overcome the immediate deficits of the stroke. The lead researcher says this. Sometimes our brain actually requires us to rebuild a neural circuit in order to make what was previously impossible, possible. Practice may not make perfection, but it can aid in precision and predictability. And that's the core of what's going on between these two circular choices that achieve the same nihilistic never-end. We need to become the master carpenter who has trained his mind and muscle to act as one in total synchronicity against time and the edge of danger. Repetition creates recall, and always forcing yourself into making a choice, even a false choice, creates freedom and rationality and logic in your internal systems. The process of making a decision is what gives us the pattern of familiarity that will help us choose the fiddle over the moron or the virus over the deplorables. Yes, we can end it. Yes, we can cut the circle. We may always want to cleave things into choices. We prefer two choices instead of three, because of good and bad, and the right hand and the left hand, danger and safety, and not the theme of the three caskets. When we are in charge of the choosing, we want black and white ease of life. And even a single shade of gray can throw us off our game, damage our stroke of logic, and press us back into the imbalance of being caught between two impossible flyings as the wicked and the monster rise on the horizon to threaten us and encircle us from afar, unless we slay them both, close up with the arc of a sharp knife.
Thank you for listening. Be a human meme.